All right, take your Bibles and let's go to Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah 63. We're on the subject of the Articles of Faith, on a series of the Articles of Faith, and we're studying the subject of the rapture and the day of the Lord. Uh, we've been on it for a little while now. We've covered a lot of scriptures so, thus far, and we still got a few more to go here. And tonight we're going to hit Isaiah 63, uh, starting with verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Answer, verse 3, I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people. You know that little saying that Abraham Lincoln came up with, of the people, by the people, for the people? Well, that's a communist phraseology. You never do things of the people, by the people, and for the people. When your church gets to a place where it's doing of the people, for the people, and by the people, shut the doors. You're supposed to do things by the Lord and by the book. Amen. Never mind the people. You preach the book, and if the people come along, fine. And if they don't, fine. You preach the Word of God. Amen. Amen. All right, he says, of the people there was none with me. That's typical. That's typical. That's what's going to be with America at the end of the day. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of, re of, of, the, of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury had upheld me. I will tread down the people in mine anger and make them drunk in my fury and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Now there's a couple of things I want you to note here. When Jesus is being described here in these verses, obviously this is the Lord coming at the second advent and the day of the Lord. When he's being described here, the writer is asking a question to him. Why are you red in your apparel? And the answer is given in verse 3, I've trodden the winepress alone of the people there was none with me. I will tread them in mine anger. When the Lord comes, he's going to stomp on his enemies and the blood of his enemies is going to splatter on the garments that he has on when he comes. Now, that's a little bit different than Revelation chapter 19. Let's go look at Revelation 19. I found this out this week when I was studying. Uh, I got to meditating on these two verses because there seemed to be a little bit of a difference there. And in fact, there is a little difference. In Revelation 19, if you'll notice very carefully, in verse um, 11, it says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness. Doth he judge and make war? His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed, now notice this, with a vesture dipped in blood. Did you notice that? It's a little different. It's dipped in blood. So what is that picture? That's the high priest. That's the high priest going into the tabernacle and presenting the blood on the altar. And when that high priest takes that blood and, and presents it on the altar in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies, he's taking that hyssop and he's splattering that blood all over the instruments and all over the furniture and all over the mercy seat. And then he takes that basin of blood and he sets it at the door of that tabernacle. Okay? His garments are splattered with blood. And that's not all. When he takes that garment off, he dips it in the blood of that basin. That's Jesus Christ. So when he comes back, he's already covered in blood. His blood. Okay? As a testimony to the world that they've rejected their only hope, which is Jesus Christ and his blood atonement. It's going to be an eternal reminder to them that they could have been saved and they rejected it and they're going to hell. Then, in Isaiah chapter 63, you've got another situation. 
Look at verse 3 again. I have trodden the winepress alone and of the people there was none with me and I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment. See that thing? Two different things there. All right. The first thing you want to notice here is in verse 1. Who is this that cometh from where? That's where Jesus shows up at first. Edom. Where's Edom? That's down at the bottom down there, down toward Mount Sinai. See? It's down in that area. I've given y'all a message, and y'all can go back and get the CD on it. I'm not going to take time to go through it tonight. Where when Jesus shows up, there's a pathway to the advent. It's called the second advent and the highway and the pathway that Jesus comes. He comes up that highway, the king's highway. And when he comes, he, the first place he lands is right there, Mount Sinai. And then when he hits Mount Sinai, he comes there through Edom. He comes through Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah. This is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. All right. Then go down here to verse 4. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of, rec of, of my redeemed has come. Now notice there that it's not the day of salvation. When Jesus came the first time, Luke chapter 4 says He came to bring salvation. He came to set the captives free, preach deliverance to the captives. You remember that? Go over there and let's look at it real quick. Luke chapter 4. Some of you are looking at me kind of not sure. Luke chapter 4. First advent, look at verse 18. Here's what he says. He's reading out of Isaiah chapter 60. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. And look at verse 19. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now notice what he does right there in verse 20. And he closed the book. Why is that significant? Go to Isaiah 61. He didn't finish the verse. And why didn't he finish the verse? Look at Isaiah 61. Look at verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord, and I said earlier Isaiah 60, I meant to say 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim, watch this, the acceptable year of the Lord. Now that's where he closed the book at the comma. And you know what that comma signifies? 2,000 years of history. Semicolon. Parentheses. First advent. Second advent shows up in the last part of that verse. What's the next part of that verse? And the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort them all that are that mourn. Now, to appoint unto them that mourn where? Not, Jeru not America, rather. To give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, and they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Now go back to Isaiah 63 again. Now you'll see it. What does it say here in verse 4? For the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed has come. That's not the church. That's Israel. The redeemed in that verse is Israel. And he's coming back for them at the second advent. He comes back for you at the rapture. Two different things. You've got to get that, folks. If you're not dispensationalist, you're just crazy. I mean, uh, you, you ain't going to get your Bible straight no matter what you do with it. Amen. You've got to rightly divide the thing. That's what Jesus did there in Luke 4. He divided it right in the middle of a verse at a comma. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to pay attention to that. Because that comma might be the difference between a thousand, two thousand years or three or four different dispensations that is being dealt with there. Alright, look at verse 3 again. 
I have trodden the winepress alone of the people. There was none with me, and I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Go to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, 15. Now, I just read to you in chapter 19 of Revelation, the second advent, correct? All right. Well, let's look at chapter 14, verse 15. And let's go down to verse 20. And another angel came out of the temple, it's the temple in heaven, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Somebody's sitting on a cloud. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. He that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. That's one thing right there. Now he's getting ready to talk to somebody else and he's getting ready to tell somebody else to do something different. So make sure that you make sure that verse 15 and 16 is dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you hit verse 17, he switches gears. And another angel, everybody say another, came out of the temple which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice, excuse me, cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather, what? The clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now, that's what Jesus said in Isaiah 63. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it where? To the great wine press of the what? Right. That ain't God's vineyard there, buddy. That's a different vineyard. The vineyard that's God's vineyard is Israel. He don't cast them into the fire. But this group here goes into the fire of the wrath of God. The Bible says in verse 20, And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even to the horse bridles by the space of 1,600 furlongs. That's approximately about three and a half, I think, three and a half miles or something like that. Let me see if I got a note on that somewhere here. Uh, let's see. No, I don't have an... I got a measurement somewhere on that. I believe it's three miles. Anyway... Is it 75 miles? Did you say 75 miles? 175 miles. 175 miles. I was thinking about something different there, Dan. I'm sorry. Okay. But anyway, I want you to notice here in verses 18, 19, and 20 is describing exactly the same thing you just read in Isaiah chapter 63. With a different spin on it. Different details. All right. Go to Jeremiah 25. Verse 30. Let's go back uh, a couple of verses. Let's go back um, verse 26. And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, which are upon the face of the earth, and the kings of Shishak, shall drink after them. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink you, and be drunken, and spew, and fall, and rise no more, because the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be, if they refuse to take the cup of thine hand to drink, then shall thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, You shall certainly drink. What cup is that? It's the cup of the wrath of Almighty God. You know who drank that cup? Jesus Christ drank that cup on the cross. And if He drank that cup for you and you refuse to take His payment for your sin, guess what's going to happen at the end? God's going to make you drink it. And that's what you're reading here. Verse 29. For lo, I began to bring evil on the city which is called by my name, and shall be uh, ye shall be utterly un, uh, shall be utterly, and should ye be utterly unpunished? Excuse me, you shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of who? That includes America, saith the Lord of hosts. 
Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words and say unto them, Jesus loves you and nothing bad is going to ever happen to you. Smile because you're going to heaven whether you like it or not. And, uh, you know, God doesn't judge anybody and he loves you and I love you and everybody loves everybody and we're all going to heaven together. Kumbaya. Yeah, kumbaya. I mean, that's the, that's the modern church today. What does he say, though? The Bible says, Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words. You'll see, when we get out there and street preach, this is what we're going to preach. Therefore prophesy thou against them, not for them, against them. Prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout, as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Now, that's that. All right, let's go back to, um, let me look at another one here. Hold on just a minute. I've got another verse here I think I want to look at. Isaiah 63. All right, let's go to, we looked at Jeremiah 25, 30. Now, let's see. Okay, look down here at verse uh, 3. I mean, verse 6, rather. He says, I will tread down the people in my anger and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Go to Habakkuk chapter 3. Negative, negative, negative. Brother Mark, you're so negative. I'm always preaching negative stuff. Why can't you preach something positive? Sure, I'll preach something positive. Once you receive what God said is about you, negative. <laughs> Back at chapter 3. Back at chapter 3. We're just going to read the whole chapter. We're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but we're going to go ahead and read it because it's connected to what we're reading right here. Back at chapter 3. All right, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon Shigianoth. That's a musical instrument. So this is actually um, kind of like a psalm. But when David is writing the psalms and when Habakkuk's writing a psalm, it, it winds up being a prophecy about the future. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known, look at this, in wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman. That's what I told you earlier. And the Holy One from Mount Paran. That's down there in Edom. And notice that word Selah. That word Selah becomes very significant because every time you see that word Selah in your Bible, it's a reference to the second advent somewhere around that verse. Either that verse, the verse before it, or the verse after it is connected to the second advent of Jesus Christ. And the reason that word is used is because it's connected to a place down there called Selah Petra, which is where those Jews wind up in the tribulation period. When they're running from the Antichrist. They're actually setting up things down there in that little place now. Because it's got underground um, caverns and uh, tunnels down there. That, that go for miles in every direction. I've seen it. And uh, it don't look like much to look at from the surface. But when you get down under that thing, buddy, it goes. It goes. It, it, and it's got water. It's got like... Waterfalls in that thing. It's got water reservoirs and they've got food supplies in that thing. Somebody's preparing for something. Somebody knows something that's getting ready to happen. I'll tell you something else that's in that little place, Sister Debbie. There's some King James Bibles down there in that little place that's translated into Hebrew. Merry Christmas. <laughs> The Bible says here, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of His praise. His brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of His hand and there was the hiding of His power. Before Him went the pestilence and burning coals went, went forth at His feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations and the everlasting mountains were scattered the perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan 
and affliction, and the curtains of the land of Median did tremble. And these are places down in Africa. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea? That thou didst ride upon thy horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Selah. He describes his word as a bow. What is a bow? When you get up there and you take that bow, man, uh, there's different types of bows you can have. And you take them, you take them two fingers right there. See that right there? That's what that liquor head in Rome runs around doing. He does this right here. He says, peace. It's not peace. It's a sign of a signa, a signia for war. Me and uh, Brother uh, Earl learned about that when we were in the Marine Corps. Uh, brother, did you learn about that when you were talking about that? That means to attack right there. We had to learn that when we were doing code, when we were out in the jungles and stuff, remember? We had to go out there like that. that that's a sign that says, all right, we're, we're getting ready to go in and attack. Just like that. Now, Rascal goes around like that and says, peace, peace, peace. And Playboy's got a thing like that. And it says, peace, peace, peace. And then the hippies in the 60s ran around like that. Peace, peace, peace. It ain't about peace. It's about war. They're saying peace with their mouth, but war's in their heart. Don't you never make a mistake about it. And that bow is you take it like that right there and you let that arrow go. And it hits what it's aiming at. And when the Lord takes his bow, which is his word, and he aims it, buddy, it's going to hit the target. That's what he's talking about there. All right, the Bible says here, he, he has a bow, verse 10. The mountains saw thee, they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by, the deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. Look at this in verse 11. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. Oh, we got a repeat of Gideon. I told you, history is the future foretold in advance. When you read your Old Testament history, you're reading prophecy. The thing that has been, Solomon says, is the thing that shall be. Is Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 8. Uh, verse eight. It says the thing that has been is the thing that shall be. The thing that is is the thing that has been. Nothing new under the sun. God says, I'm going to write history in advance and write the future in advance with the history in, uh, over here. You read this history. I'm telling you what's going to happen out here in the future. All right. He says, the sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst stretch the heathen in anger. He's going to throw them from side to side. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of who? The Not the church. <laughs> That's Israel. Even for the salvation with thine anointed. Look at this next part. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. Selah. That's a reference to the Antichrist. Go to, uh, take your Bible and let's look at a few things here. Micah chapter 2. Micah chapter 2. In fact, somebody get me Micah chapter 2, verse 13. Somebody else get me Obadiah verse 15. Somebody get me Psalm 68, 21. Somebody else get me Psalm 7, verse 16. And I'll hit Psalm 74, verse 13. All right, who's got Micah 2, 13? You got it? Read that real loud to me, brother, like you're on the street preaching. Okay. The breakers come up before them. They have broken up and they have passed through the gate and have gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. On the what of them? Head of them. That head is going to show up several times in your Bible in reference to the Antichrist being stomped in the ground when the Lord shows up. Who's got up? Obadiah verse 15. All right, read that, Taylor. 
For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Upon thine own head. You remember Sisera in the Old Testament? Remember that stone that wound up hitting him on the head? Yeah. Uh, one of them had a peg pushed through his head. That thing keeps coming over and over again in the Old Testament. And it's giving you a picture of something that's going to happen in the future when the Antichrist shows up. God's going to mess that head up of the dragon. And he's going to mess up the head of the Antichrist. Two heads that's going to be hit. Satan's and the Antichrist. Who's got Psalm 68, 21? Anybody got it? I have Micah 2.13. You have Micah 2.13. But I, also, I, won't, I was in that one, but I didn't. Somebody else said Okay, who's got... Well, somebody look it up for me real quick. Psalm 68, verse 21. I got it. All right. Um, but God shall wound the head of his enemies, and the hairy skull of such an one as goeth on in his okay, he's going to wound the head of his what? Enemies, plural. Now that's significant because when you read Revelation chapter 13, the dragon has seven heads. There's a plural nature to Satan. I don't know if you know that or not. If you don't know that, I've taught it before, so you might want to go back and study your Bible a little bit on this. Point on Matthew chapter 13, or Matthew, um, yeah, Matthew 13, was it 13, 12, wherever it is where he says, I am legion, for we are many. That's Satan talking. That's Satan talking. There's a plural nature to him. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. What does he say at the end? I will come back into the house, my house. And he's going to bring seven other spirits with him. You know what that's a counterfeit of? The seven spirits of God. There's a plural nature to God and there's a plural nature to Satan. God is a trinity. Satan has a trinity. Satan's trinity is the dragon, the antichrist, and the false prophet. That's the, that's the trinity. And there's a, there's a plurality to that thing. And when he speaks, sometimes he speaks in the singular. And sometimes when he speaks, he speaks in the plural, just like God does. See? Alright. Somebody read me Psalm 716. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. On See his own pate? Patent. Yeah, pate. That means his head, top of his head. That's talking about the Antichrist. Now look over here at Psalm 74. Psalm 74, we're going to look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads, plural, of the dragons in the waters. There's a body of water out there somewhere. There's some dragons in it. And it's not the Atlantic Ocean like Christopher Columbus thought. And it's not the Pacific Ocean. It's not the Indian Ocean. There's a body of water up above your head. And that dragon is swimming in that water. That's his domain. He's the prince of the power of what? Up there. And he's aquatic. You know what that unclean spirit was looking for? A wet place to dwell in. Demonic spirits love warm, wet places. Think about that for a few minutes. That's the Key West. That's Miami. That's Hawaii. That's all those places where these demonic spirits gather and manifest themselves through people. Warm, wet places. The Bible says he goes through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. He's not living in the dry places. He's traveling through it looking for a warm, wet place to get into. Human body is a warm, wet place. It's 98% water. See? He'll settle for a pig. But he'll run that pig off the mountain into what? The sea, yeah. See that thing? He's always looking for water to dwell in. He's called a serpent. 
See? He's the, he's, the, he's the cherub over the aquatic animals and the birds. See? All right. That's why he's got wings. Take your Bible and look at this for a minute. Next thing he says here, Thou breakest the heads of the Leviathan in pieces and gave him, look at this thing now, to be what? To the people where? Well, now we got some light on where the manna came from. He struck the head of that dragon and out came this white hoarfrost substance that fed the people in the wilderness. Guess what's going to happen in the tribulation period when the head of the dragon is wounded? Same thing is going to happen again. It's called manna. How, uh, Disney has a counterfeit of that. How many of you ever seen Sleeping Beauty? Remember that dragon in the movie when they struck the neck of that dragon and out came that stuff? Where do you think they got that from? <laughs> they probably don't know. <laughs> Thou didst cleave the fountain and the flood. Thou driest up many uh, mighty rivers. All right. Let's go back over here to Habakkuk again. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 14. Thou didst strike through with his staves the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Now, I've showed you before that in the tribulation period, they're going to turn to cannibalism. And they're going to be eating God's people on an altar in Jerusalem in a worship service. And they're going to be naked and they're going to be fornicating while they're doing it. Okay? And they're going to be eating them literally. It's not, it's not something where it was uh, make-believe or figurative. And I'll show you that in a few minutes if you want to see it. In fact, let's go look at it. Go to Micah. <laughs> Chapter 3. Look at verse 2. Who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of what? My people. My people. And flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones, and chop them in pieces. Afore the pot as flesh within the cauldron. Then shall I cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. The church age, the, the uh, Jewish people, the nation of Israel, unfortunately, are a bunch of atheists and a bunch of infidels. If they die right now uh, in that condition, they'll go to hell just like any other lost man. But one day in the tribulation period, God is going to bring this stuff on them to woo them back to Him, and He's going to bring trouble to them. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. God's going to pour His wrath out in a way upon them that's going to cause them to get so small in number, but the remnant that is left is going to turn to the Lord. That's found in Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10, and Romans chapter 11. And this is a small glimpse of that. Another place, if you want to see it, is found in Psalm 16. Let's go look at that one. Psalm 16. It's cannibalism. Hollywood's getting you prepared for it as we speak. They started out with Dracula and um, other things where they're drinking blood and now they've got The Walking Dead and they got all these zombie movies where they're just eating flesh and the American people are getting so numb to that stuff that when the real thing takes place, it won't even phase them. American culture has been exposed to so much violence and shooting and gunfighting that they did a study recently where when the real thing broke out, people stood around in trances like they, they, they wouldn't even move because they were so numb to what was going on and the real thing was happening. Mm -hmm. They'll pull their phone out and start recording it. Now, you tell me that the devil ain't preparing people for something? Psalm 16. Look at this one here in uh, verse 4. 16.4 Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of what? Will I not offer nor take up their names into my lips? They're going to be drinking blood. 
Go to Psalm chapter 14. Look at verse um, 2. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Now this is in the tribulation period. This is a prophecy. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none, everybody say none, none. that doeth good. No, not one. That's not the church age, folks. Christians do good. At least you should be. You do good works, don't you? Okay. But there's come a the time on this planet where it's going to be said, there are none that doeth good. No, not one. And as a result, you're going to have verse 4. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? That's literal. That's not figurative. They're going to eat them on an altar in Jerusalem. Alright. Let's go back to Habakkuk again. Let's look at verse uh, 15. All right, thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of great waters. That's the great body of water above your head. When the Lord comes out of the third heaven, that body of water that's fr the frozen deep is going to split open as He's coming and descending down through it and you're coming in behind Him. That's what He's describing there in verse 15. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses, plural, through the heap of great waters. That's a repeat of Exodus 15.10. When I heard my belly tremble, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. That's the church. The troops are the church. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Even despite all this stuff that's going on, he says, I'm going to rejoice at the end of the day. In the, in the God, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. All right, let's go to, where are we at? Okay, let's go to Joel chapter 2. That troop is described there. Now let's find out who that troop is. Joel chapter 2. I don't know about you, this stuff fascinates me. See how God's laid this thing out. And the details that He gives in it. But the details aren't all in one place. That's the tricky part. You have to find a little bit over here and a little bit over here and then you put it all together and you get the big picture. See? That's the way the Lord works. He makes you work for it. Alright, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh. For it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. This group of people that he's getting ready to describe, he says they're unique and there's never going to be another group of people like them and there's never been a group of people like them before nor will there be any like them afterwards. Now he's getting ready to describe them. A fire devoureth before them, verse 3, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, 
and as horsemen, so shall they what? Run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Whoever this is, it's an army. Before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And look at this next part. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Whoever this group of people is, when they go to stab them with the swords, it don't hurt them. <laughs> they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. What does that remind you of? Revelation 16. Jesus Christ says, Behold, I come as a thief in the night. He's coming back with His people and He's coming back with the church, and he's coming back as a thief in the night to steal those children of Israel that have turned to him from the clutches of Satan. Alright, verse 10. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. What does that remind you of? Matthew 24, Revelation chapter 6. That's describing the second advent. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his what? Army. For his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? You know who he's describing there in those verses? He's describing you born again Christians. In your glorified bodies coming back with the Lord to fight their enemies. That's who that is right there. So you can rejoice in that. And you can say, man, the Lord sure did describe a pretty good deal there for us. He gave us a body that can't even be destroyed when it's stabbed. <clears throat> we don't even feel it. And they can run up the wall. See, Hollywood again has got a counterfeit of that. He can leap a uh, wall in a single bound. Superman. Superman. Yeah, he flies through the air. Guess what? You can do all those things too in your glorified body. And when you come through there, you've got one mission in mind. You're going there to rescue those Jews that have trusted in Christ and destroy God's enemies. Anybody gets in the way, you destroy them. He's going to send you out on missions through the city. Go get them. <laughs> and, uh, and we're going to go get them. <laughs> and nobody's going to stop us. Uh, you know that's the army of the Lord because of Revelation chapter 19. Go to Revelation 19 and you can compare it and you can see what I'm talking about. Revelation 19. Verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and righteousness. He hath judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew he but himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Come in to fight. Come in to fight. That's what an army is. An army is here to fight. An army is not here to play patty cake and be a daycare center. An army is equipped and trained to come into battle and destroy everything in front of it. Period. And that's why I'm glad we're behind the Lord and His enemies are in front of Him. Alright, let's look at another one here before we uh, close out here tonight. Uh, I think we looked at Jeremiah 25.30. Let's go to Jeremiah 46.10. I got that one noted. Let's look at it. Jeremiah 46.10. Sunday night, Q&A now. Just keep that in mind. 46.10 Puts new light on the scripture that says, For this is the day the Lord has made. 
we will rejoice and be glad in it. You know what you're going to be doing when you're destroying God's enemies at the second advent? You're going to be rejoicing. You're not going to be sitting there feeling sorry for these people when you're killing them. You're going to be rejoicing that they're dying. <laughs> now imagine that. There won't be no, uh, man, I, I really hated to kill him. No, you're going to be glad you did. All right, look over here at uh, this verse here, verse 10. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance. He may avenge him of his adversaries. The sword shall devour, and it shall be sated, and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath the sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. That north country over there by the river Euphrates, you're going to look at your map and look at it. That's going to be Turkey, that's going to be... Um, all those Muslim countries up above Israel. And it's also going to be, if you go further north, it's going to be China, it's going to be Russia, it's going to be all those places. And God is going to destroy them. Now they may get to America first. And they may get America out of the way as far as the world power. But God is going to have the last battle. And He's going to destroy them. All right, he ain't forgot that Russian bear, and he ain't forgot that Chinese dragon. Go to Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whether I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. That's how you know they're going to repopulate. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. That's probably you and I. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. That's Jesus Christ. In his days, Judah shall be saved. That's in the uh, millennium. And Israel shall dwell safely. That's the millennium. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Notice how that's worded. The Lord our righteousness. Never forget that. Go down to verse 19. Verse 19 says this. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury. Even a, excuse me, a grievous whirlwind, it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until it hath executed, until it hath performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you shall consider it perfectly. And in verse uh, 21, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people... To hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. If a preacher is not preaching against sin, he's not a preacher. If he's not preaching against things that's going on wrong, he's not worth his weight in salt. Now, Brother Earl can remember this and Brother Jack and maybe some of the rest of you, I don't know. We've had situations in this church where people been in here and have come in and caused divisions and strife and, and trouble. And the pastor's job is to nip that thing in the bud. It's not to make people mad. It's to get the church in unity. And a preacher that won't do that ain't a preacher. He ain't a pastor. He's a hireling. He's tiptoeing through the tulips. He's trying to make everybody feel good and kiss this baby and kiss and hug this one over here and love this one over here without while he's ignoring the problem. The Bible says where there is strife, finish it. There is confusion and every evil work. So when there's strife, you gotta Deal with it right then. You got to nip it in the mud. That's what we were talking about the other day, brother. You got you got to pull it out. You don't pull that little blade of grass out. After a while, man, that thing gets into this big old bun. I was out there working at my fence today, and just in a in a winter period, 
that stuff is growing in the winter. It has to be. And I get out there now trying to get that stuff away from all those flowers, Sister Debbie. And, and Sister, I'm going to tell you something. Pulling them things out, they have wrapped all around that thing. They have had a chance to grow and get up in there and wrap around those flowers. You literally have to dig it all up and separate them and put the flowers back in the ground. A lot of work. That's the way it is if you ignore problems in the church. What are we supposed to do? We're to love one another. We are to have harmony and peace with one another. Bless your hearts. I don't have that problem here. I think I've got a good crowd here that loves one another. But I'm going to tell you, in the past, we've had some people in here that were doozies. And they created problems. And they were just... <laughs> I said, in the name of Jesus, you are in the Lord rebuke you, Satan. All right. Uh, we got we got to handle it. we got to handle it. Now, Jesus said here in... Where are we at here? We're verse, these pastors say it would not speak God's words. See that in verse 22? To hear my words? Then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil they're doing. Am I God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? In other words, am I not both? Can any hide himself in secret places that I should not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I feel heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophet said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, here we go. You ready? You ready for the communist? I have dreamed. I have dreamed. That sounds familiar. That sounds familiar, don't it? Card-carrying communist. Fornicating in every city. Had a, had a mistress in every city. While getting up in front of the American people and was the, um, the darling of the media. You better watch out who you listen to. These snakes come in sheep's clothing and they're wolves, they're ravening wolves. He was a communist, he was a Marxist, and he hated everything that you and I stand for. He didn't believe in the virgin birth. Showed that to you. He didn't believe in the virgin birth, yet people found he was one of the greatest Christians this nation ever produced. Oh, Michael. Yep. Mike King was his name. He changed his name to Martin so he could be like the reformer. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. See how they do that? The the popes change their names to give you you a little spiritual name, you know. I'm Pope John Paul. Yeah. Very supportive changes name too. That's right. That's right. Tell them again. Very supportive. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh you know, right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Muhammad Ali. And he's married somebody that's named Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce Jenner changed his too. <laughs> they changed their names. Why? Because they're hypocrites. That's what it is. Hypocrisy. All right. Let's see where we're at here. We've got a few more minutes here. All right, we've got a few more minutes. Let's see a couple more verses here before we close here, guys. Uh, let's go to... Did we hit 25? Nope. No, we didn't get that one. Let's see. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 30. Try to hit this one and close right here. There's a lot in this one, but I'll read it kind of quick and kind of give you the highlights of it. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. God has a special place in his heart about a book. And yet, the scholars don't believe you should have a book. They say we don't have a book that we can go to. They're the authority. They're the final authority. I've got a book that God wrote, and it's my authority, and I don't have to go to nobody else. i got His words. All right, the Bible says here, The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words, that I have spoken unto thee in a book, for lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their, fo- their fathers, and they shall possess it. So, Stephen Anderson's a liar. Because he says that ain't going to happen. <laughs> Tex Mars a liar. He said that's not going to happen. 
All right. These are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. No peace. Ask you now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail. You'll want to underline that and run the references on that in your Bible. Because that shows up several times in your Bible as a woman in travail. And it's always connected to Israel in the tribulation period. And all faces are turned into paleness. Elias, for that day is great that none is like it. It is even the time of the church's trouble. <laughs> but he shall be saved out of it. Is that what it says? Nope. It says the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke, that's the Antichrist, from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God. And look at this next part. And David their king whom I will raise up unto them. David's coming back. He's making a second appearance. There it is. Alright. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord. Neither be dismayed, O Israel. For lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. Notice that rest there. He shall be in rest. That lines up with Hebrews chapter 4. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. The people of God, not the church, the people of God. And that rest is defined by them being back in the land under the leadership of Jesus Christ. That's where the rest comes in at. It's not spiritual rest like you got when you came to Christ. It's a physical rest that, they take pl that takes place when they come into the land at the end of the tribulation period and the millennium begins. And Jesus Christ is their head. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations. That's the United States included. Whether I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. Notice that he does not reckon Israel with the other nations. He keeps them separate from the other nations. He's going to make an end of all nations, but Israel's not included in that number. But I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Therefore, the tribulation is what, what happens. For thus saith the Lord, Thy bruise is incurable and thy wound is grievous. There is none to plead thy cause that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. In other words, they can't fix their problem on their own. They think they can, but they can't. All thy lovers have forgotten thee. Nobody around you is going to help you. They seek thee not. For I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. In other words, God said, I'm going to turn you loose and let sin run, run in your uh, race and run in your nation, and it's going to mess you up and spread you out everywhere, and you think these people are your friends, and they're going to turn on you like an enemy. And that's exactly what's happened to the Jews for the last 2,000 years. Everywhere they've gone, every country they've gone in, they have had enemies. Most of the nations that they ran into ran them out or killed them. The United States has been the exception. Why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable for the multitude of thine iniquity because thy sins were increased. I have done these things unto thee. Therefore all they that devour thee shall be devoured. So in the tribulation period there's going to be some cannibalism and there's going to be some cross cannibalism. And all thine adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity, and they that spoil thee shall be a spoil. And all the prey upon thee will I give for a prey. That's Revelation nineteen seventeen through 18 is where that's fulfilled at. When God calls the fowls of the heavens to come in for the great supper of uh, the Almighty God. And what it is is unclean spirits that come down into the earth and eat the carcasses of these people. All right. The Bible says here, For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord, because they call thee an outcast, saying, This is thine whom no man seeketh after. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents, and have mercy on his dwelling places, and the city shall be built upon her own heap, the palace shall remain after the manner thereof. Out of them shall proceed thanksgiving in the voice of them that make merry, and I will multiply them, and they shall not be few. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. 
There's the increase of the nation, Brother Earl. That's where they repopulate, right there. Their children also shall be as aforetime, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all that oppress them. There's, there's the millennium. And their nobles shall be of themselves, and their governors shall proceed from the midst of them, and I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach unto me. For who is this that engaged his heart to approach unto me, saith the Lord? And you shall be my people, and I will be your God. That's a reference to Israel. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord go forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the house of the wicked. Those are the verses we read tonight. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he hath done it, and until he hath performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days you shall consider it. And that's what we're doing here tonight, folks. We're considering what God has said. Amen. And on that happy note, we'll end it right there. Anybody got any questions on what we went over tonight? Did you learn anything? There's a lot there. Next week we'll hit Zechariah 10 and go through uh, chapter 10, 11, 12, and 13. And then we'll hit Isaiah 65 and 66 and keep moving east to west. <laughs> All right. That's a lot of stuff in that chapter. But you can see different things in that chapter. You see the second advent. You see the regathering. You see the repopulation of the Israelites. You see the millennium. You see the destruction of the Antichrist. I mean, there's all that's in one chapter in Isaiah. But if you don't have a New Testament, you won't see any of that. That's why the hearts are blinded, brother. Yep, that's why their hearts are blinded. Their hearts are blinded in part till the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Thank God He made a way for us to come in. Amen? Amen. Thank God He had that little pause in there and said, P.S., I'm going to bring this little group here in and make, bring them in to make you jealous. Amen. God is using the Gentiles to get that Jew nice and jealous so they'll turn to the Lord. And, that's, and it's right and it's good. Praise God. All right. Anybody got any questions? All right, let's close in prayer.